As you can see, I'm standing here on the, um, hey guys, guys, hello, guys, guys, come on, hello, over here, over, a little bit more, a little bit more, come on, all right, all right, that's better. Now, as I was saying, I'm standing here on the old Canyon Creek Bridge, and will you guys just look at this thing for a second? Do you see how narrow this is and how windy it is? Now, just imagine this being covered in sheets of snow and ice and having a semi come streaming at you in the middle of winter. That's pretty nerve wracking if you ask me. And that's why many people called this section of the road from here to Summit Lake, the Luge Run. Now, when that bridge was built in 1997, they took the old bridge and the road, the old roadway and created a bike path on it that many people now use today. You guys should really come and check it out down here. Anyways, this bridge crosses Canyon Creek. Now, it's called Canyon Creek because it obviously flows through a canyon and it meets up with a river called Six Mile River, obviously named because it is six miles from the former town of Sunrise. Now, the area where these two streams meet is known as the Forks. Now, the Forks is a nice, quiet place to stop and have a lunch beside the stream. That is today. However, back during the late 1800s, this was not a quiet place. In fact, it was the exact opposite. Very busy, very loud, and very dirty. The Forks was ground zero for providing supplies and support for much of the gold mining in the region. Now, in order to understand the Kenai Gold Rush of the 1890s and the early 1900s, you've got to go back a few years. Quite a few years. Okay, guys, like millions of years ago, to the Mesozoic era, when the Kenai Peninsula was being formed. Now, I know it sounds a bit bizarre, but much of South Central Alaska is composed of chunks of land that were actually brought here from far, far away. These moving chunks of land, they're called terrains, were pushed north through the process of plate tectonics. They kind of just floated along with the plate, then got stuck here, creating South Central Alaska. Most of the Eastern Kenai Peninsula is made up from the Chugach terrain. Now, understand that most of the Chugach terrain is composed of two major groups of rock, the McHugh complex and the Valdez complex. You can actually see the fault between these rocks at Falls Creek at mile 105 of the Seward Highway. You'll see that the rock tends to look different. Rock from the McHugh complex tends to be lighter in color, however the rock from the Valdez group is actually darker in color. But there is another difference between these rocks, and if you happen to be a gold miner, it is a big difference. These rocks were formed differently and at different time periods. Because of this, the McHugh complex has no gold. Bummer if you're a gold miner with a claim on the McHugh side of the border, right? However, the Valdez group has seams of quartz, and some of these seams of quartz are flecked with gold. When locked within the rock, the gold is called a load deposit. Now, since these chunks of land arrived on the scene, we've had several ice ages. As the climate cooled, snow would persist year after year in the mountains until glaciers formed. In fact, during the last major ice age, which was some 23,000 years ago, most of the Kenai Mountains were buried in glacial ice. Now remember, glaciers are moving rivers of ice, and as they move, they gouge out the V-shaped valleys 
into the broad U-shaped valleys that you see through much of the Kenai Mountains today. Now, the gravel and rock that was broken up by glaciers ended up in the bottom of the valleys. This included the quartz and the gold as well. Now, gold is dense, guys. It's heavier than the gravel. So much of it ended up as flakes and nuggets within the gravel, often towards the bottom in concentrations called placers. Now, guys, just to make sure that what I said made sense, let's do a side view of what we just saw. Here is a cross-section of the mountains with a lovely stream running in the valley. And there's the quartz vein running through the mountain, and in the quartz vein are bits of gold. Now, here comes the ice age and the glaciers fill up the valley. As the glaciers move forward, material is removed from the sides of the mountains, and this all ends up on the bottom of the valley. Then the glacier melts. So, mining in the Forks area consisted of two basic strategies. Load mining, that's hard rock mining, digging directly into the quartz seams, and placer mining, trying to separate the gold from the gravel deposited by the rivers and glaciers. Placer mining was the simplest and had the fewest cost. In the simplest form, all the placer miner needed was a gold pan, some hand tools, and perhaps a sluice box to help separate the gold from the gravel. Well, that and a lot of luck. Striking it big meant staking a claim directly above a hidden pocket of gold dust. Hey, check this out. You might remember this guy from the Hope episode. This is Robert Burns Matheson. And those sacks in front of him? Well, they're called pokes. And yeah, those pokes are filled with gold dust. 385 ounces of gold dust. Yeah, he struck it big. However, most weren't that lucky. Many ended up leaving the country with less than what they arrived with. Soon, other techniques evolved. Here on the Kenai, hydraulic giants were used to remove the overburden. That's the thick layer of gravel on top of bedrock. Flumes and ditches brought water to these high-volume, high-pressure lines. They would move the gravel into equipment that would allow the gold to settle out. Then, they'd pick out the nuggets and sweep up the dust. Now, the other strategy was load mining. Load mining was totally different, for it dug long tunnels through the hard rock and quartz veins, trying to locate seams of gold. Long shafts, they were called adits, would be blasted into the hillside. Then they would take the chunks of rock and crush it in stamp mills. Finally, the gold would be extracted chemically or physically from the ore. This technique required the greatest investment for equipment and men. The most successful operations were owned by companies or men able to make the capital investment. You can see evidence of load mines all throughout the eastern Kenai. When you are at mile 49 of the Seward Highway, just south of Summit Lake Lodge, look up on the mountains to the west. You'll see zigzagged lines going up the side of the hills. This is what is left of the trails leading to the mine shafts dug into the quartz veins. But just like placer mining, there were no guarantees on results. Harry Johnson, the guy you met in the Victor Creek episode, tried his hand at load mining. You might remember that Rachel said he was tough. Well, he dug two tunnels near his cabin on Resurrection Pass. One went 600 feet into the side of the mountain, and what did he get for his grueling efforts? Two ounces of gold. Yeah, like I said, not everyone struck it rich. By 1905, the gold was starting to play out. The easy diggings were gone. 
People were either leaving to go back south to their homes or going to other gold rush areas such as Nome, Fairbanks, or even the Iditarod. Others decided to stay here and live out their lives in either hope or sunrise. There isn't much evidence left of the frantic gold rush activity here besides this bridge and a few other working claims. The gold fields are silent and the wilderness has returned.